picked up. Okay, that's fine with me. Um, and so they've been doing uh, plantings. Um, they recently, I think they were in the paper, there was an article in like Erie News Now uh, that they were, they're doing work at, for example, at Leo's Landing right underneath the um, feather platform and right in that area. So some of it has to do with, you know, planting species, trying to get species established. Some of it has to do with removal of vegetation. And so, for example, to remove the Phragmites, uh, there are some interns that go out there. Some of it, you know, they can remove by hand, but most of what they've been doing is by going out there with backpack sprayers and spraying herbicides on Phragmites. Um, I'm trying to remember if it was last fall, if it was the fall before, uh, there have been seasons where they have closed the park off for part of a day and have done spraying by helicopter to get to areas that the, the, the park interns um, can't get to. And it seems to be, okay. So just going out with your binoculars and standing by a roadside somewhere, you're gonna miss the marsh bird species that are out there. Uh, you're gonna have to have a lot of luck if you're gonna stand at a point for three points. And if you did that, you'd come up with almost nothing. So um, I have a set of, of points and I'll show you on the maps and, and more about that later. But basically we've established some points out there. And then according to the protocol, uh, uh, I try to estimate where I hear a bird or where I see a bird and estimate its location. And I use GPS then to, or GIS uh, and GPS to, um, uh, to mark on my uh, map app on my phone um, uh, to mark where it is. And I try to estimate, is it within a hundred meters or is it beyond a hundred meters? And then um, to do the surveying, uh, we have to have some conditions, uh, weather conditions. It can't be too windy. Um, that is something that occasionally I have to stretch a little bit at Presque Isle because as you know, oftentimes it's, it's windy all the time up there during the summer. Uh, the, the formal cutoff on the protocol is 10 miles an hour. And basically a couple reasons. One is that with, with winds gustier than that, uh, it, it blows on your ear and it makes it harder to see birds far away. Um, and so it's harder for me to hear the birds. If I'm trying to play the calls to the birds and it's too windy, uh, they're not gonna hear them. Uh, at some point that will, the higher winds will keep them from flying from one point to another. So it reduces my uh, chances of actually observing a bird. And then of course, at some point it becomes dangerous for me to be out in a kayak. Uh, if it's too windy. And so when I do point out in Presque Isle Bay, out toward the head of the bay, um, definitely I, I don't want to be out there when the winds, I actually specifically look for when the winds are, are even much lower than 10 miles an hour uh, when I do those surveys. Shouldn't be raining. Raining is going to affect the, the noise of the rain is going to affect the ability to hear the birds. Um, uh, uh, and so um, uh, uh, it shouldn't be raining. So what we do is a five minute introductory silent period. And then I have calls on my iPhone and um, I have a, 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 a portable speaker that I hook up to it through Bluetooth. And so after the five minute introductory silent period, I play 30 seconds of different calls of, of a particular species and then 30 seconds of silence. And then I do it again for the next species and the next species. And so we've been um, surveying for eight particular species uh, during the most recent survey period. Uh, when Anne did it in 2011, um, she had another species uh, that she surveyed uh, in addition. So if we're doing eight species, 30 seconds calls, 30 silent, one minute per species, plus five minute introductory, the total survey time period per point then is 13 minutes. So, um, these are the current uh, 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 set of points here. Um, I'm going to try and move that out of the way. So I don't, yeah, there we go. Um, hold on. There we go. Um, okay. So um, those are all the, the points. Those are the hundred meter radius circles around all the points that I've I've surveyed um, in recent years. 
So, um, and we're surveying for eight species, uh, uh, leaf bittern, uh, Sora, Virginia rail, uh, king rail, uh, American bittern, common gallinule, uh, American coot, and what I like to call the peanut butter grebe, but it's actually pie-billed grebe. Uh, and then in 2011, uh, uh, Ann played tape calls for um, black rail, uh, which is not something that we typically expect, uh, uh, but they were surveying for it. So um, you'll notice on the left there that, that the number of points that has been surveyed has increased. And so let me bring in, um, let me shift over to Google Earth. And um, let me view, actually, I do need the navigation thing. So um, so those are the um, 28 uh, 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 places where Ann surveyed. And so um, these were ones generally uh, 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 several different locations. Uh, at the very bottom left, that's the um, cattails and phragmites at the, um, there's, should be, huh, well, for some reason it's not showing them, that's my goof. Um, uh, so we have the, the, the cattails at the head of the bay uh, and the phragmites, um, uh, cluster by uh, Sarah's campground in the park boundary. Then some points around Leo's Landing. And then we have uh, Long Pond and the Lagoon Clusters and Duck Pond uh, starting from the Low Bridge where you enter the Ecological Reserve. Uh, and then some points along the, um, uh, the Lagoon Channel toward Graveyard Pond uh, uh, where there's uh, uh, the boat rentals. Uh, there's some points here along the sidewalk trail uh, to survey Ridge Pond. Uh, there's a point here um, called Cranberry Pond, and it's uh, uh, accessible from the um, Marsh Trail. And in recent years, it's been often under several feet of water, and so I hardly ever see anybody back there. Uh, and then uh, we have Niagara Pond here, which has no uh, formal uh, canoe launch. Uh, and it's rather inaccessible due to the dense vegetation that you can see uh, all those green patches on um, Google Earth here. And so I never see anybody go back there. Uh, and then some kayak points out uh, around Thompson Bay and then starting to get out toward Goal Point. And then this particular pond is called um, Dead Pond here. So that's what Ian started with. And by and large, those points are easy to kayak to. What I did is then I started expanding that. And so I added a bunch more points in um, Niagara Pond, a bunch more points in Big Pond, uh, and um, uh, some other points. And I don't know why, but my points here, uh, the, this cattails here at the head of the bay um, where uh, the Purple Martins have roosted in previous years, uh, there is a survey point there and somehow it got cut out of. Um, Chris, excuse us. Yeah. Sure. Um, we, we are not seeing the Google Earth image. Oh. Um, we, are seeing, we are seeing the map with all the red dots or circles on it. Uh, and it, and it's, got, it's the slide that says like survey points and stuff on the side? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Let me try on doing full screen on that. Now can you see Google Earth? No. We are just seeing your your um, your your PowerPoint presentation in in the um, creation mode as opposed to the slide. Oh, download. I know, I know what I need to do. Um, I need to go down into Zoom and. Um, so you were pointing things out, and unfortunately, for those yeah, people who don't about know what that. they are. Okay, so they weren't, they weren't seeing. Yeah, when I do this in Google Me, I can just switch from one screen to another. And let me see. Okay, what I got to do is I got a new new share, and I have to go in here, and then I have to go Google Earth. There we go. 
So sorry, it's a little bit. We're uh, still not seeing it. For doing it. Maybe this you is. You should it. see Google Earth. Okay, now, now we're seeing something. Maybe kind of different. wiggling it around. Um, can, you, can you see me zooming out now? You yes, can see the yes, United States. Yes. All right, good. All right, so sorry, I use Google Meet when I teach, and it's a little bit easier to switch back and forth between applications. Okay, so, um, all right, well, <laughs> let, me, let me just go. So, so let me just, let me, um, so, so, so this is where all the circles, those are the 100 meter circles. Uh, that's where Ian surveyed in 2011. I added some additional points that are kind of hard to get to that you have to paddle through some dense vegetation uh, in Niagara Pond and Big Pond. And then I added uh, another few more points uh, out at uh, uh, Gold Point and another couple places. And then I started to do a um, survey route out at Gold Point where I walk a whole bunch of points, including all the way almost out to the, um, to the observation platform. The water's been high year, that habitat's just completely gone right now. But two years ago, there was uh, about halfway out to the, um, where you hit the, uh, uh, the open area, um, uh, 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 about halfway out to the platform, uh, uh, there, there was an area of enough cattails that supported uh, uh, least bittern populations. And then in 2020, I added some more points uh, as the water got higher. That meant there were certain areas uh, that the and as they controlled some of the vegetation and removed the phragmites, I was actually able to get to areas that I wouldn't have even imagined trying to get to uh, back in 2017. So those are all the points that I've surveyed. Um, and so if we zoom in, here's uh, we'll start at the head of the bay. Uh, there's a phragmites cluster with some uh, cattails and such. Uh, right bordering um, uh, uh, Sarah's campground. And um, uh, then we have two points here that uh, are these cattail islands that you can see off of uh, Vista One. So at the top of the screen now there, you can see uh, Vista One parking area. And uh, these are areas where Purple Martins uh, had roosted uh, uh, in the past, in the, in the late summer. Let's zoom out and then go up to Leo's Landing. So I do all these by kayak. Um, my first point at Leo's Landing is right near the feather platform. Then there's another point uh, uh, further out um, uh, 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 toward the uh, uh, exit out toward uh, Prescott Bay. And then this area of the point to the right, if you go out there now, I didn't survey that the last two years. There is no vegetation there at all, except for a couple places where there's some cattails growing like an inch out of the water line, and that's it. And so all this area right here has been flooded out. There used to be some little islands and sandbars that had some dead trees on them. Uh, all those sandbars you see and all that vegetation, that's 99% gone, not because of vegetation control, but simply because of the record high waters. And so that point, I didn't even survey. I could look out with my binoculars as I was kayaking into Presque Isle Bay, and I could see, well, you know, there's like three cattail stems sticking an inch out of the water. Uh, clearly, there's no birds there. So I didn't even bother to survey that. But I have had birds out there, as you'll see on some of the later maps uh, in previous years. So here we get into the long pond cluster. Um, uh, 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 the leftmost circle is Duck Pond, where there's a bench there. And then uh, that's where the road splits. And then you'll see a sign saying you're entering the ecological reserve right before the low bridge. So I have a point there in the channel. I have a bunch of points along Long Pond. You can see here the main channel that 99% of the kayakers that I see pretty much restrict themselves to the main channel along the south edge of Long Pond. Um, these two circles up here are kind of interesting. That's called Pond of the Woods. And Prior to two years ago, I wasn't surveying those points because it wasn't accessible from the main uh, lagoons. It was only accessible from the back end of uh, the maintenance areas there. Uh, but you can see here that uh, if you, you know, some of the vegetation, the high water and some of the vegetation removal opens this up, you can see now that there actually is access 
Uh, some of it's hard to paddle through, but you can't actually get back there now. Um, and so uh, uh, there's a whole series of points here along Long Pond and some of the um, uh, side channels off that. Uh, and then here we have, um, when I do these sets of points, I enter in my kayak in Graveyard Pond. I go up past the boat rentals, and then I come into the lagoon channels here. This complex in the center of the map is called Big Pond. Uh, and I'll show you a video of what it's like to kayak through some of that. You can see the dense green areas of vegetation. Um, and then there's some more points in uh, uh, um, side channels of, of the lagoon channel. Uh, these two points here, this uh, right in the center here, that's called a boathouse pond. Is not where the houseboats are. That is Horseshoe Pond. And that's over by, you can see it easily from the air here, that's over by the Coast Guard and North Pier. So that's called Horseshoe Pond. That's where the houseboats are. This one here, there must have been a houseboat in it because it's called Boathouse Pond. Um, almost nobody ever goes back there because to get back there, you have to go through this narrow little channel here and when the water was lower and before they did some of the vegetation control, there was a very, very narrow channel where you had to crash through a little bit of cattails to get to it. And then you could kayak back there. And so if I want to take a nap after my surveying, I come back here. You're right, pretty much right about here is the geographic center of the oval part of the park, of where the road circles. And I have done surveying on 4th of July morning, and you can't hear at 5.30, 6 in the morning, you can't hear any traffic, even at 10 in the morning when people are starting to kayak from the boat rental, you can't hear them. Uh, all you can hear is your own thoughts and the birds. And um, uh, uh, it's amazing on a weekend, 4th of July or Memorial Day um, weekend that you can be back in there and it feels like you have the whole park to yourself. Uh, and so I had my little secret entrance to, to get back there. Uh, when I did uh, the kayak tours, I did three kayak tours uh, at the end of July and into the first couple of weeks of August. And um, I took people back into this side channel here. And that's the area where this year that happened to be good for veterans. And so I was able to take them almost back to the second point on the far left here. Uh, and it was a place where the current conditions were such that there was a way we could sneak around and through this vegetation uh, without um, uh, it being too hard for, for novice kayakers. And so people had a lot of fun. Um, there's a few points along the sidewalk trail here for surveying Ridge Pond. Ridge Pond has generally too much woody vegetation. Uh, I've had a couple of bitterns in there, but I'll show you that on the map later. Um, this complex here is called Niagara Pond. There is no formal boat launch in there. There are a couple of parking lots here just before you get to Fry's Landing. So you can see right here at the bottom, that's where uh, at the bottom of that uh, uh, area there, you can see that's where they dump debris. And then uh, at the south end of that, that's where uh, in the woods here, that's where um, uh, 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 the bird banding operations have been done uh, at Fry's Landing. So just before Fry's Landing, um, I generally park in this small little lot here, and uh, I just have to pick a spot to put my kayak in, and then I have to kayak through some really dense vegetation uh, about almost a half mile to get all the way up here at the north end. But the north end, especially the northwest end, has been a place where I've actually found nests of least bitterns. Um, and I've gotten lucky and found those there. So it's worth the trip, but nobody no fisherman, nobody is ever going to kayak back there unless they're looking for bitterns, basically. Uh, and it's to get up to the north end, it's like 20 minutes of pure power paddling uh, uh, to get through the spider condensed vegetation to get up there. So I added all these points up here, uh, a bunch of points up here um, uh, uh, to explore that. Um, I've got a couple points, this wetlands area at the south end of the card. I started doing that the last couple of years without any results. I started doing this point because Brian Burstold, 
found a family of pied bill grebes in this wetland that extends down to the southwest uh, from this parking area here. I haven't had anything there, but uh, he, he was able to get, uh, uh, he saw a family of pied bill grebes. Um, this area that looks really nasty and acidic and all the brown uh, stuff in there, um, that's uh, Thompson uh, Pond or Thompson Marsh um, that's near Thompson Circle. Uh, and this is an older photograph. This is from 1985, it looks like, um, or no, 2015 is when this is from. In recent years, if you drive by, it looks much, much better. Um, I have had a least bitter on the other side of the road here once, uh, but I've been surveying that now that it looks promising. Then there's some kayaking points and in some of these inlets. And then there's uh, a foot route that I do all the way out to uh, uh, um, Goal Point. And so the, the observation platform is right down here. And so about halfway out, when you're out in the open and the signs say, you know, stay on the, on the trail, about halfway out there, there's a place here where there have been cattails in recent years. And I have had binners out there, but the last two years, the high water just completely destroyed uh, that habitat. But I'm hopeful next year uh, it'll come back. So that gives you an overview of just all the diverse uh, areas that I have been surveying. Um, you'll notice there's one area here that I have not surveyed. And, you know, there's not really necessarily good habitat up along the pine tree trail up here, but this area here is called Yellow Bass Pond. And I've tried a bunch of different ways to kayak in there, to hike in there, the high water the last couple of years didn't help. And it looks like it's from the Google Maps, you can see it looks like it's really woody wetland along the outside. Uh, I did get back in there once, and it just, you know, it'd be like, it would take me a whole morning just to get back in there. And so generally um, I can do anywhere from around five to eight, sometimes nine or even um, 10 points in a morning uh, uh, if the points are strung close together and um, I kind of, you know, hurry, uh, uh, do quick paddling in between the points. So I start, I get to the park at five in the morning when the gate opens, I'll try and get my kayak in the water at 5.15 when uh, you hit twilight, sunrise around 5.45. And so I go ahead and start then and survey until about 8.30, 9 o'clock-ish, uh, depending on whether it's real hot or uh, other conditions. Okay, so um, I need to do screen sharing. I need to do a new share. I need to go back to my PowerPoint. And let me see if there was anything I was gonna say. Um, oh yeah, okay, so let's go to, so uh, Mary, can you see uh, pictures of a bunch of the birds on my PowerPoint slides? Yes. Okay. Eight target species. Yeah, okay, so, okay, good. That's what I wanna show. So these are our eight target species. Uh, I tried to get these sorted to scale. Uh, and so we have our least bitter, and that's really the main one that we're looking at. Um, it is a state endangered species. Um, it is, I believe, threatened nationally. Um, and I'll show you when I show you the maps of, of where they occur. Uh, really, the, the two strongholds of the species are Southeast Pennsylvania Tentacum Wildlife um, Refuge, and then basically the, the wetland complexes uh, up here, uh, Connie at Marsh um, and uh, uh, Presque Isle. Um, Soras uh, uh, are small little wetland species, minor species, just a couple of observations. Virginia rails, I'll show you them. They've, be, they've been becoming more abundant. They're super abundant down in Erie Wildlife Refuge and Connie at Marsh, but uh, for various reasons, they seem to be less abundant uh, uh, up at um, Presque Isle. Uh, this bigger rail that looks like the King Rail is, um, or it looks like the Virginia Rail is the King Rail. Uh, I have not found any and didn't find any, uh, and so um, I'm not going to talk about them much. A couple summers ago, I did have one calling kind of late into the, um, you know, into the summer in, in Connie at Marsh. Uh, so no King Rails. Another one that we have not found in 2011 or in the last five years is um, the American Bittern. And I see them migrating occasionally uh, in Connaught Marsh, 
used to be I would see him yearly back in the early aughts. And then I didn't see him for about 10 years. And then in recent years, I have seen them in migration uh, in Conneaut Marsh. I think I heard that they did have some uh, in some of the um, surveying that the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy uh, has been doing um, there. Uh, uh, they have had some American veterans this year. Common gallinule is a marsh bird, sometimes swims like a coot. Uh, it's got um, these large feet so it can walk on vegetation. Uh, and it's got this red frontal shield that you can see way from a distance. And uh, uh, um, then here's the coot that tends to swim more, but it can also hide back in the vegetation, has a white bill and frontal shield that's real obvious. And then we have the pied billed grebe, um, which uh, swims around in vegetation and um, uh, can also stay extremely hidden. So let me go ahead and I think I'm going to do it without the speaker first and see, let me ramp up my sound here. So can you hear that? I can. Maybe I'll turn up the speaker here. How about we do that? So this is this is, this is the leaf bittern call. Uh, their main call is a ko ko ho and it sounds almost like they're laughing at you. Ho 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 ho. Uh, sometimes they have a slower one uh, when the males start to get desperate at the end of the breeding season. And sometimes I find a male is just calling over and over again and end up, I don't see a female around it. They'll give a very rapid ko 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 but generally it's a co -co -co -co, kind of three or four co's in there. And so let me go ahead and um, play it here. <laughs> and then now we'll hear the keck keck call, which is more like an alarm call. Oh, that's more cocoa, sorry. <laughs> and then now you hear the kek sound, which they make later in the summer, especially on the nest. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip Sora. Well, actually, maybe I'll just play Sora. <laughs> And so they kind of do that descending whinny call. Whoops. So that's the Virginia rail, this descending grunting noise. They also make a call that goes ticket, 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 ticket. Uh, I'm not going to play King Rail since um, we don't get those. I'm not going to play the bedroom since we haven't had those. Gallinules kind of make a series of whining uh, calls. They always sound like they're unhappy. <laughs> and sometimes those whines, they can make single notes <laughs> like that, like, you know, oh, what was me? Uh, Here's a American coot. And then finally, here's the uh, pied bulb grebe. It almost sounds kind of cuckoo like the first type of call. <laughs> And then they make a call that almost sounds to me, I call it the motor, the engine won't turn over call. So it's kind of like sounds like you're trying to start a car and it just won't quite catch. Okay. 
So, um, okay, so those are, that's the introduction to the species uh, uh, that we had in their calls. And so uh, I didn't play all the calls in all their glory, but it's 30 seconds of calls, 30 seconds of silence, and then all eight species plus a five minute silent period at the beginning means that I'm at a point for 13 minutes. Um, and now, oops, here we go. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go from the, the minor species up there uh, to the ones that are the more focused. So let's get these guys out of the way. Um, Sora, yeah, a couple of observations. So uh, um, what I've done is um, I've, I've color coded. Uh, um, actually, let me. Oh, no, I can't do that. Never mind. Ah, shoot. What did I do? OK, uh, can you see the screen? Sorry. Can you see the solar map? I, I, I cannot. Oh, OK. Hold You're on. You're not sharing. Yeah, I just I clicked something. But then it didn't like what I did. I clicked the wrong thing, and I got to be punished for it. OK. Um, now do you see it? Yes. OK. So what I've done is I have um, color coded by year, and I've done it by the colors of the rainbow. So red is 2011, yellow is 2017, green 2018, kind of a cyan 2019, uh, blue 2020, and then kind of a violet is 2021. And then um, I've done a, each bird has its own symbol. So the Sora is the hexagon here. And you can see there's a couple of, of observations that Ann had in 2011. I had one in 2017, one in 2018 haven't had any in the last few years, uh, you know, different places, the observations are really hit or miss up there. They're just not part of the marsh bird uh, fauna up there, but you can find them in uh, Kanye Marsh. Um, American coots are one that's, uh, let's see, Anne looks like she had one down in the, um, by Sarah's campground in 2011. Uh, I've had um, one that was, you know, just happened to come across it while I was kayaking. Uh, in Long Pond in 2019. But this year, I had uh, a pair of them uh, in the cattails uh, where the martins roost. And then I also saw, I decided to count them as just one pair rather than two, because I'd see them sometimes there and I'd see them sometimes more down uh, uh, towards Sarah's campground. But I'm pretty sure it was just one pair. Um, I spent a lot of time with looking at watching them and later on in the season, trying to figure out if they were breeding and I am inclined to think they weren't um, because I would see them swimming back and forth between those two places. Uh, and I never saw any young and it was late enough to, in the season that if they had young, they should have had them around um, uh, uh, following them. You can also see both the Sora and the, so I got these pictures and maps from uh, Cornell's All About Birds site. Um, you can see that they're both widespread. You can see coots though. You can see really in terms of being a breeding bird in Pennsylvania, you can see that we're not really quite in their range. We're very much on the edge of their range. And so, you know, we get some now and then, but they may not necessarily be breeders. Um, here's our cute little peanut butter grebe, the pied-billed grebe. Uh, and it's, um, uh, 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 you can see that, that um, uh, where you're going to find it. I've, you know, had one up in Niagara Pond, uh, had one in Leo's Landing, just kind of a chance observation. But really where Ann found them and then where I found them in recent years uh, is down the cattails there. And I'm kind of inclined to think that they were breeding this year, um, but I just, I, they were just really sticking themselves deep into the, into the cattails there, those islands. And it's just, it's dense enough. And if I try to go in there and, you know, see them, I'll just chase them and they'll go somewhere else. And so I, I could hear them calling quite a bit, but I never could be sure that they were breeding. Uh, I did mention that in that parking area um, uh, 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 toward the Coast Guard, it looks, doesn't look like good habitat for them. It's very woody wetland. It's kind of an isolated pocket of wetland. It's not connected actually to any other wetlands. But that's where Brian Burst told uh, had um, uh, uh, he photographed some uh, um, with some young uh, uh, last year there, and so I surveyed it this year and, and didn't have any. 
So they have been breeding. Uh, I suspect they bred this year down in the cattails at the head of the bay. Um, Virginia rail, uh, you don't see very many red symbols. That's because Ann had one out at Leo's Landing. Uh, I didn't have any in 2017. And then I had a few in 2018 and 2019. But you can see the blue and the purple symbols. You can see that I've had a lot um, more uh, in the um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, long pond and in the, the lagoon complex in the last two years. And I have confirmed the breeding. I saw some young last year. And when we did the kayak tour, uh, uh, um, we got to see uh, uh, some young, um, uh, 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 I got to show them. Uh, they came out and poked their heads out of the, uh, of the vegetation. And some of the, um, the first group of kayakers, first and second group got to see them. The third group, uh, we just got to hear them. So you can see they're widespread across breeders, the red zone across the Northern United States. And like I said, they tend to be more abundant and widespread in uh, County at Marsh and at um, Erie National Wildlife Survey, because I have done marsh bird surveys back then, 2005 in the Erie Wildlife Refuge and 2010 in um, County at Marsh. And I found uh, Virginia rails. Gallinules uh, in the main part of uh, the oval of the park, kind of scattered, abundant, but kind of different places from year to year. Uh, I did find a big pond. Uh, I did find um, uh, 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 some adults with some cute little black fuzzy chicks. Uh, you can also see that we're kind of on the edge of their breeding range uh, um, in Pennsylvania. Uh, they're considered kind of breeding along the Great Lakes and a little bit along the Atlantic coast. And then the interior part of the state, it says, um, you know, breeding, but uh, uh, less common. Um, and then finally, before we get to the least bittern, so this is just the overview. And, you know, there's kind of a lot of symbols there. And I'm going to go to Google Earth and kind of point things out from, from different years. But this is all the data. And so you can see that. Um, that they've been found all over Presque Isle in a variety of places. You can see some years they've been present, some years they've been absent. For example, at Leo's Landing, uh, those areas, all those areas, I had them in 27 and 2018, but then the high water just kicked them out of there and I haven't had them in the last three years. Uh, one time I watched a, um, uh, I was out in my kayak in Leo's, in the water out toward Leo's Landing and I watched a juvenile leaf bittern foraging on the edge of the wetlands there, right by the bike path that goes by, you know, north from the, um, from the feather platform. And I was out in my kayak watching, and I could see people running, jogging, you know, walking, bicycling right behind it. And when I went back over there and walked and saw just how narrow that little bit of habitat was, people were walking within five meters from it. And, you know, they wouldn't have seen it because there would have been vegetation blocking their view, but um, I could see it uh, uh, from where I was um, in the kayak. And so this is a bird that, that people are not going to see for the most part, uh, uh, um, unless you go out in the kayak and you know where to go uh, uh, and look. So first off, let me um, scoot over to... Um, Let's do stop share. Let's do sharing and I want to do Google Chrome. And so I should have. Um, so let's take a look at this. Can you see the do you see the video now um, of a YouTube video? Yes. OK, great. So let me go full screen on this. And so this is video I took in 2017 in a pretty inaccessible part of um, uh, uh, Niagara Pond. And um, this is just with my cell phone. And so um, those are marsh wrens and swamp sparrows calling in the background. And I was, I had been playing the calls and it came out, this is a male because it's got the black top head and the black back. And it 
came out to investigate me. So sometimes you get lucky and they poke their snouts out of the marsh vegetation, but oftentimes, most of the time they don't and you'll hear them calling. But I got lucky, this guy's just keeping an eye on me. And now watching what he does with his neck. <laughs> it's, that's how far they can stretch their neck out. And then it's gonna fly off here. Actually, let's see it fly off so you can get an idea. There it goes. And so they're not very big. I mean, they're like the size of a robin, basically. Uh, they're about half the size of a green heron. They're about a quarter of the size of a great blue heron. And so the way they feed is they will clamp onto the vegetation with their legs and they'll be just above the water and they'll reach down and they'll walk the water and then they'll stretch out that long neck and they'll pluck out aquatic insects, crayfish, small fish, uh, uh, things like that, 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 that then they can swallow whole. Uh, and so um, uh, uh, that's how they um, uh, do that. Let me see. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, here's one. Here's one out at Gold Point uh, where I was in my kayak in one of the inlets. And you can see this is for all Phragmites here. But I had one calling. And it's kind of soft because it's kind of further back. And it's given that more rapid, desperate call. You can hear warbling vireos and other marsh bird vegetation. So I listened to that when I recorded it for 60 seconds. That one called for about 20 minutes nonstop, which is really unusual. But I never ever saw any birds there. And I, I think at the time of year, uh, it was um, you know maybe getting uh, desperate. Um, how about a Virginia rail uh, uh, showing itself? And so it's right middle, lower center of the screen. Oh, didn't like seeing me. And now you're not going to see it again. <laughs> and that's that. Um, Uh, so what is it like to do this uh, uh, serve? Oh, let's do the com uh, gallinule calling. You can't see it. It could be two feet behind that vegetation. And I think it might have had a nest near there. It didn't like me. That's uh, at the head of Presque Isle Bay. Um, yeah, so here's what it's like kayaking when you're not in the open water. And so uh, this is spatter dock. It's the easiest of the vegetation to uh, kayak through. And I'm putting all my strength into every um, uh, uh, stroke. And so I got to go all the way to the tree line because that's where the bit into a nest. And I think this is, I'm pretty sure this is my other time. Plenty of uh, little gnats flying around. Now I'm getting out into a little more open water and it's getting a little bit easier. You can see at the tree line, you can now see there's a line of cattails right at the base of the trees in the distance. And that's where I'm headed. And let's go uh, a step up. This is uh, uh, the pickerel weed. It's very pretty to, to go through, but it's a little bit harder. The vegetation is a little more dense and higher.
and you don't coast at all like you are if you're in the lagoon, you know, in the main channel. So I need to make it all the way to that big tree in the background. And that's where my next point is. And then finally, um, I need to stop share and then I need to share screen and I need to go to, I need to go to Safari. I don't know what, oh, that's a Zoom thingy. Uh, this is a picture of a, um, a juvenile gallinule that I found uh, in October one year. I have no idea if it was a bird that uh, had fledged that year. Uh, in um, big pond area or um, uh, whether it was one that was already migrating south. But the juvenile gallinules, when they get to adult size, they actually have this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, greenish cluster. But let me find, this is the advanced version. So this is this year, the smart weed is usually, it's a little worse than the spatter dock, uh, but usually they grow in separate clusters. But this was smart wheat and spatter dock growing mixed together. And so it was just absolutely impenetrable. I had to get to some points. Hold on, let me. There we go. And so you can see the spare dock right in front of me, and then I'm heading into the smart weed. This was in Big Pond. And when I did my circuit of Big Pond, the, the east end is open water to get to the first point, but then to circuit up the west end and make it back to the lagoon channel, I had to kayak through about 500 meters of this stuff. You make so the I, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't blame anybody for not um, wanting to uh, to survey that part. Uh, so that's when the and didn't survey and I started doing it and it wasn't that bad in previous years. But this year there was one stretch that was just really bad. And to get to it, the, the, the reward at the end of that, though, was was the place where I had the, the baby uh, gallinules. Um, Let's play, this is in the uh, cattails this summer. And this is where I had the, the greaves and you can hear some uh, gallinules uh, calling in the background. So you can hear the calp calp of the, of the greave and you can hear the whining notes of the gallinule. And I remember that morning, I don't have films of the birds because they never showed themselves. They were just always hidden in those cattails. This is where the purple martin roosts have been. Um, and so, um, uh, uh, um, uh, let me see, where do I want to go to? I wanna to go to Google Earth now, I think is where I wanna go. Um, uh, actually, I need to show. So um, let me take off the survey points. And let me go into the least bitterns. And let me show the legend here. So um, it's colored by year according to uh, colors of the rainbow. And these are all going to be circles. Um, and so let me show 2011. So keep in mind as you're looking at this though that I'm surveying more points as I'm going along. So some of the uh, finding them in, in other areas has to do with 
just not having surveyed those points before. Some of it, I think, is honestly is, is that they uh, 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 did expand into certain areas. So here's where Ann found them in 2011. Um, I have a table that I'll show the actual numbers uh, uh, and such. Um, this is where I had them in 2017. Now, there's a caveat to this. I was doing two different surveys up there. And uh, uh, because what they wanted me to do was to kayak around and when they were gonna spray areas for vegetation control, they were trying to do it during the summer um, because that's when the college interns were there. But I totally messed up their plans because uh, Holly Best uh, 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 of the park office would uh, text me and say, you know, we wanna uh, uh, do this particular area tomorrow or, or in the next couple of days. And so can you go out and survey it? And I had a different protocol. I was out there for 20 minutes and I played exclusively least bittering calls. And so a number of these things are findings that were not during the regular protocol uh, of, of these were just things while I was kayaking around. And so that does inflate the numbers a little bit, but you can just see just how widespread and abundant they were, um, especially in like Niagara Pond, then Lagoon Channel, Leo's Landing, uh, et cetera. Even there were even some in a little patch of vegetation uh, in um, uh, Horseshoe Pond. So that's 2017. Then here we go in 2018. Um, let's go to 2019. You'll notice a pattern here. One is Leo's Landing, they're gone, water's too high. Uh, along, so uh, here's where I had them. Uh, say in 2017, and you can see that uh, they had done a lot of vegetation control in Long Pond. And so that area, uh, because they, they sprayed in the cattails, uh, they opened the water area. There was a couple years where this, this was just not as good a habitat. But then you can see they start to bounce back 2019, uh, or 2020, excuse me, 2020, and then 2021. And so it used to be you could kayak along Long Pond and along, um, let me just go ahead and put all the data in here then. Um, you could kayak along uh, 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 the main lagoon channel coming from the, the, the boat rental and then turn the corner and come up Long Pond here for the low bridge. And sometimes you could just see a bird, you know, serendipitously fly across, or you could maybe hear them calling. There are some big cattail islands that now are no longer there. Uh, and so part of it's the vegetation control. Part of it is the um, is the high water knocking some of the vegetation back. And so they're still in there, but you see the yellow circles uh, along the main channel of Long Pond or uh, the main lagoon channel. If I take those off, you can see, and especially 2018, you can kind of see in the last three years, um, you can see that uh, you have to go off the high channel and, and back up toward the very north end of the complex uh, uh, to find the, the least bitterns. So just kayaking along the main channel, you're not gonna find them. You gotta either brave the vegetation down in Big Pond, you have to know where the side channel entrances are as you know, you, this, 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 uh, um, this particular channel here, you can, uh, you know, there's, there's like some narrow entrances and if the vegetation's thick, you won't see your way back in there. And so most people just see, oh, there's vegetation and they won't go back in there. Um, and so they're still there. It's just, you kind of have to know where to look for them uh, 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 to find them. And so um, uh, uh, this is, for example, why I had them last summer. Uh, I mentioned that in 2019, if we look at the cyan dots, I actually had some least bitterns, I saw them and heard them calling in this little bit of cattail area halfway out to the, um, in the open area toward the observation platform. Uh, I even had some in this little patch of habitat, which it's mostly Phragmites, uh, uh, but there was enough habitat and then that, that I had them a, a couple of years. Um, and so, uh, um, you can see that I had some in the kayaking parts, uh, uh, but when the, ve the vegetation control is in the high water has knocked that back. So it's taken a few years to get it back. Um, 
there is, uh, uh, I never saw this bird, but the, um, some of the bird watchers here can tell you the story about the um, least bitterns that nested at the sound of Niagara Pond right near the road, uh, 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 kind of across from Fry's Landing. And so um, uh, one year they happened to do that, but you can see where I've had them, you often have to go all the way up to the north end of Niagara Pond. Uh, up in here is a couple places where I just got serendipitous, I happened to find a nest. So the thing about confirming breeding in these birds is when you wanna confirm a robin, okay? And if you were doing the breeding bird atlas and you said, I'm gonna find robins. Well, they arrive in the spring and they're singing from the treetops and you see them on lawn. So there they are. You've at least seen that they're there. And then you see the males battling each other. And so that marks them up a level, they're territorial. You might see a pair doing courtship. Uh, and so you can mark it up to the next level of, of breeding confirmation. And then you see them carrying a stick or you see them carrying a worm. And so that means they're building a nest or they're carrying food for a nest. Or you, you know, follow the bird and you actually see the nest. None of that applies to least bitterns, okay? They don't, uh, when they arrive in the territory, they're hidden in the vegetation. So you're not just gonna see them battling each other, you know, out lawn. Uh, when they call, they're out in the vegetation. Unless you play the calls, they, they don't even actually call that often sometimes. And so you have to elicit the call by, by playing the call. Sometimes they'll peek their head out, but I can sit in some of these spots where I know there's bitterns, I'm done with my survey, I'm just gonna hang out there and take a nap, and I, hang, I can hang out there for two hours and I'll hear them call four times. Maybe I'll see one fly once. So without doing the playbacks, you're really at their mercy and you're not gonna detect them. Uh, they don't carry sticks to a nest. They find a nesting place and the male bends down at tails and builds a little platform there. So you're not gonna see them carrying sticks like you see great blue herons or green herons. Uh, you're not gonna see them carrying food because they swallow their food whole and then they fly into the nest, they'll fly into the cattail, you can't see where the nest is, and then they'll regurgitate that food for, the, for their young. And so unless maybe you happen to see that their crop was full, normally you're not gonna get that look. So I found two nests, I happen to just get lucky and see a female fly off. What I do is when I see a male and a female together, if I'm lucky and I happen to see them and I can see that there actually is a female there, then I'll, I'll do extra surveying to try and see if I can find the nest. And I just get lucky. I know where it is. When I go back there to observe, I have a little spot 30 meters away because I don't want to observe them because they're an endangered species in the state. And then I will have noted, you know, in my notes, I have to look exactly at this spot, at this little broken bit of vegetation, and then I can look through my binoculars. And if I know exactly where to look, and if the bird's got its bill sticking up a little bit, then I'll be able to, to, to see the nest. But that's it. Otherwise, you could kayak within two meters of them and you'd never notice them. Um, and so uh, the other way to confirm them is to see the juveniles. And that's, that's what I had this summer. And I was actually show, able to show um, some of the kayak uh, trips uh, people that, that I took the trip on. And I was actually able to show them uh, uh, one of the juvenile birds. Um, and I got lucky and just you know happened to, to spot it. Um, I went and pond of the woods, this little two purple circles. Do you see how those two purple circles are uh, overlapping there? Why is that? Because I had two birds right next to each other. And so let's go to the survey circles. And so there's my survey circle. And so the center of it is, let me go ahead and put the survey points. Uh, so the center of it is right here. I'll put it right smack in the middle of um, the screen there. So that's point 301, and that's my circle. And I played the calls, and I actually heard a bird calling more from probably beyond the edge of the circle, kind of in this area, closer to these trees over here. And I could hear the male calling, and then it flew in in response to me playing the tape. So it flew into where one of these circles, uh, purple circles is, and I noted the observation and I was watching it, and then it started calling. Then I saw the female fly in from over here and she flew in right next to him. 
And then boy, he got all excited and he started doing some calls and then he climbed on top of her to copulate. The only problem with that is, is right where they happened to be was they were on the water where there was a lot of dead cattails that was biodegrading that had fallen down from previous years. And so it formed this mat and they could walk on that with the weight of one bird. I wish I had gotten a video of this, but when the male climbed on the female, that was too much weight and she started to sink down into the water and she was not, not having any of that. And so she kind of hopped away and flew off a little bit. And then I saw her fly back off toward this tree line over here. And then I saw the male fly back off toward it. So I thought, oh, you know, they're probably nesting around here. I just saw them copulate. So I would kayak up into the pond of the wood and I would watch them and I would always hear them calling back further away, the male. And if I saw one fly, it was way back in here. So I actually even found another way back there from the main lagoon channel and kind of went back in there, but I just, it was impenetrable woody vegetation and so they may have nested but i just i couldn't get back there uh, uh to observe it so i've gotten to see them copulate once uh uh and that happened to be this summer um uh right there okay um all right let me get back to the data i can tell plenty more stories if you want to hear them but let me get back to the data um and um uh i want hey chris powerpoint screen do i want hey yeah. it's mary you're you're almost at an hour just so you know yeah that's what i think, so I'm, I, that's think why I'm I think at. some of us may be dozing off oh sorry am i being boring no you're not being boring but it's friday night and we're yeah. old okay yeah. okay. <laughs> okay so um so here's your least bitter and here's all that can you see the 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 the, the powerpoint screen now Yes. Yeah, okay. So um, you could see on the map there that they are widespread around the Midwest Mississippi Valley, but in Pennsylvania, they only nest in Great Lakes Northwest uh, glaciated area, and then a little bit along uh, uh, the Delaware um, River area and some of the marshes there. Uh, and so this is one of their strong po po uh, points in the state. So um, this is just kind of a tabular thing of um, of uh, 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 the actual, some of the actual numbers. So in the least bitter, the first row there is just how many birds I saw that whole seed, uh, 2011 is, is Ann's data. And so um, then the second row for each species is how many birds were seen during the protocol period. So within a hundred meters of the survey point, and during the 13 minute survey. And so um, uh, uh, a couple of years, I did two visits per point per summer. The last couple of years, I've done three visits. So I would make three rounds and visit all the points. So this year I did three times 58, that's 174. I went and played the tape and sat at a point for 13 minutes. I did that 174 times this summer. Uh, and it took me from the middle of May through the middle of July. It took me about six to seven weeks between bad weather. I basically went up every nice day that I could survey. I got up and, and went up into the park. So um, then the third row for each species is um, how many points I saw the species at uh, within the protocol. So you can see that there were a number of birds, like in 2017, I saw them in other places that were not within one of the points. And it was when I was doing a different survey or I just happened to be kayaking along or sometimes I'm at the point and I do my survey and I don't have any bitterns. And then I start to kayak away and then one calls or I see one. And so those are species that get knocked out of the total individuals. And so you can see in 2017, doing the actual protocol I had 31 individuals at 17 points. So you can th see things like Sora, American Coot, Pied Bell Greek are, you know, just scattered uh, individual reports. Um, uh, the Galanules and now the Virginia Rails are becoming more common. Um, this is per data for the last two years. I was looking at it and something didn't seem right. And I eliminated the points where I saw them outside of the 100 meter radius 
but I didn't quite get to eliminating birds that I may have seen at the point, but outside of the 13 time period. So you might be able to lop off a couple off those um, numbers. So you can see the numbers fluctuate a bit. Um, uh, uh, the high water definitely impacted the birds, especially this summer. There were areas where it just the vegetation hadn't rebounded. I'm very, very hopeful that next summer we may get seeing uh, birds in Leo's Landing and some of those uh, uh, areas. So um, some final conclusions. Um, uh, uh, no bitterns, American bitterns or king rails. We haven't had them there. Uh, and it seems unlikely that we'll get them there in the um, future. Uh, Soars and coots probably don't breed, just rarely sporadically see them scattered places. Uh, pied bowed grebes had them a number of different years, but not every year. Uh, and they have been confirmed breeding. Um, and I seem to have more observations recently of them. Uh, Virginia rails are becoming more abundant. Uh, I think part of that's due to the vegetation control. Uh, and I've been able to see babies. I've never found a nest, but I've seen babies of them the last three years. Um, Gallinules are widespread, but where you find them tends to shift from year to year. Uh, uh, and I've confirmed breeding of them this year. And then the bitterns, maybe a dozen pairs, sometimes more uh, in the park each year. Fewer uh, back when Ann was doing the survey because the Phragmites really choked out a lot of the habitat. So, uh, you know, if you just look at the, the number of points and the number of birds, uh, you know, she had 11, mine fluctuate between 20 and 30 during the survey protocol, uh, but some evidence that they may be in the upper 30s, even up to 50 back in 2017. I don't think there's that many now because of the loss of, of habitat due to the high water. But you can see that they, there could be potentially up to two pairs maybe nesting uh, uh, in the park in a given year. Um, this is a nice picture of the um, newly restored habitat in uh, Thompson Marsh. So this is just north of Thompson Circle, looking to the east, and it looks a lot better than that aerial photo uh, from Google Earth. Um, so I conducted all the surveys 2017 through 2021, and Baylog did the survey in 2011. Um, so uh, uh, thanks to the State Park and DCNR, uh, our funding came from um, Wild Resource uh, Conservation Fund, uh, National Fish and Wildlife Sustained Great Lakes, Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Uh, and some of that, I'm not sure every year, but some of that has been partially managed via um, Ducks Unlimited. And so the initial survey I did in 2017, and I believe that Ann did in 2011, were supervised by Sarah Sargent, um, under the aegis of Audubon Society Northwest PA. She had that little office on Chestnut Street in Meadville. Uh, but then since 2018, through the great work of Mary Birdsong, Laura Marie Coit, uh, and Sarah Sargent um, forming Erie Bird Observatory. And so uh, 2018 through 2021, uh, that's all been done under um, uh, Erie Bird Observatory. 